when we look at emerging infectious diseases like COVID-19, for decades, we were recognizing about three a year. Uh, in this last decade, that's up to about five a year. We know that in the viral families that are known to cause human disease and be shared with other animals, that there are at least 500,000 viruses still to discover that can infect us and could make us sick. And so we, we've only scratched the surface. We are now going into remote areas that have viruses that have been there for millennia, but people haven't been getting exposed to them. We are exposing ourselves uh, to things that just aren't in our evolutionary history and we're really at risk. A zoonotic disease is a disease that is caused by a pathogen that is shared between animals and people. So anything that we might get because we interact with an animal or we interact with people who have interacted with an animal, especially those animals that um, we haven't interacted with throughout our evolutionary history, that's the perfect circumstance for us to get a new disease. But zoonotic diseases aren't new. Um, the most classically famous one is rabies. There are many diseases that are now primarily human to human that were originally zoonotic diseases, like HIV AIDS and influenza that we deal with every year was at first a zoonotic disease and it's human to human, but every now and then we pull in new genetic material and we get remixing from birds, from pigs, from horses, from all sorts of other species that are also susceptible to influenza. So zoonotic diseases are much, much more common than people think about, but it's really those ones that are coming from wildlife that surprise us. SARS-CoV-2 has the equipment to be a jumper. We say a jumper, so it jumps species. And the more species and the broader range of species that a virus can jump into, the more we worry about it having epidemic and pandemic potential. And so this one at first was only in people as far as we knew, right? And we could use the science to say, most likely suspect for where it evolved is a bat, just given all the probabilities and what we know about it. There were certain kinds of bat hosts that were almost certainly the original evolutionary hosts of this virus. So we were able to jump in really quickly and say, hey, if you know the distribution of those hosts, you can start to get a handle on where the virus may have originally spilled over. And if there's a new strain, it may be that migratory animals brought it to multiple areas. There's a lot of scientific discussion about a spillover event from a bat into an intermediate host or another animal before it may sit into people. And we know with the first SARS that that's believed to be for sure the case, that there were bats that had their pathogens mixing and spilling over into civets, um, which is a, an interesting carnivorous creature that are also sold in markets, and then people got exposed to those civets. And that's probably true, but uh, it's all based on circumstantial evidence months after the actual spillover. And so this is probably what's going to happen with SARS coronavirus too as well. There'll be a lot of information that comes out for decades and we'll be able to piece uh, some things together to understand what really happened. But we do know now that you don't need that intermediate host to collect and get the extra equipment in the virus to then get into people. We were able to figure that out before SARS-CoV-2 happened, that the bat to human is also a direct possibility. Bats are really interesting. 
they have some really interesting evolutionary mechanisms that probably make them better vessels for maintaining viruses and being a source to us and other species. One is they fly long distances, so they sample from a lot of different areas, and then they can distribute over a lot of different areas. Another has a lot more to do with their metabolism and their immune systems. They actually evolved to fly, and we think that there are some really interesting mechanisms that allow them to have much higher body temperatures and be able to function and not get sick that also allows the viruses to be there and evolve whereas in a person you might have a fever and fight it off. And we study those flighted things just less than we study dogs and cats and cows. So it makes sense scientifically that we're gonna find a lot of things in bats, but it also is concerning because we have spent so much less time in scientific history doing that work. One of the first species that we recognized that it was actually spilling out of people were cats. So people's cats in their homes, first and foremost, but then we saw big cats like tigers and leopards at zoos. Um, and then looking at dogs, we could see that dogs could get infected. Over time, we saw people infecting mink at mink farms in Europe and in North America and saw that mink were very likely to be a very good host and there was a lot of tragic depopulation of huge numbers of mink because of that. Our white-tailed deer population in the U.S. Uh, appears to be infected. We hope that people won't interact with them in a way that they get exposed, but certainly uh, that possibility exists. I want to be clear, it's not the animals that are putting people at risk, it's our human behavior and the risky things that we do that put ourselves at risk for exposure to these viruses. They don't jump out and grab us. We, for example, go into caves and mines in places that are previously uninhabited. Why? To get us things to make our cell phones lighter and everybody has a cell phone, right? And so we, the way that we are using the planet as opposed to living with the planet in equilibrium is also causing that change. This is especially important for the Amazon rainforest because we know that the majority of undetected coronaviruses should be, because of the hosts, harbored in the Amazon. And yet, what are we doing? We're destroying the Amazon, hurting our own ability to get oxygen and keep our planet at the right temperature, um, and at the same time causing extreme risk for spillover because it's at those buffer areas where we're transitioning environments that we see these spillovers happen most frequently. So it's human population growth, land use change, us going more and more into more remote areas. We are going there more often and we are going there more destructively and we are going there in large numbers and we are bringing with us our domestic animals because we need food and those viruses can spill over into them and amplify and change before they spill over into people. We're talking about the interconnected health of the whole planet, the people, the animals, the environment. Uh, and when we do protect that, we protect ourselves for the longer term.